All right, let's see what uh, would have been from Amazing Spider-Man 3 with Andrew Garfield. Garfield's The Amazing Spider-Man 3 never happened. The return of Garfield and No Way Home left many fans wishing Sony had completed its planned trilogy. But it may surprise you to learn that Sony had much more ambitious plans than that. And yep. before The Amazing Spider-Man 2's failure, Sony was planning a massive Spider-Man cinematic universe of their own to compete with Marvel's. So let's dive in and find out what that would have been like and what could have been The Amazing Spider-Man 3. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is one of the greatest accomplishments in the history of cinema, grossing tens of billions of dollars and elevating comic book heroes into colossal mega franchises. But like anything successful, it doesn't take long before your rivals try to replicate that success for themselves. That's why, following the success of the MCU, we saw several other studios try to create cinematic universes of their own, True. such as the Dark Universe featuring Universal Studios' roster of classic movie monsters, the DC Extended Universe, the Monsterverse, as well as... Yep. Oh, MonsterVerse is still going strong. Others. Sony, after realizing they own the rights to Spider-Man's rich cast of characters and villains, decided to get in on the fad. So for those of you who enjoyed The Amazing Spider-Man 2 and were looking forward to its sequel, you'd have to wait, as the next film in the Spider-Man cinematic universe would have been The Sinister Six. Yep. And leading this group of supervillains would have been none other than Norman Osborn. Now I know what you're thinking, Norman died of an incurable illness in The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Well, not exactly. Cut from the film was a remainder of this scene, which originally was supposed to be a post credit scene that would have seen the mysterious gentleman, Gustav Fears, enter a top secret level at Oscorp and walk past several chambers containing gear created for villains that yep. Fears would recruit in the following movie. Eventually, Fears would have arrived at a chamber containing the frozen head of Norman Osborn before saying, wake up, old friend. And while this scene was cut, the container that would have held Norman's head can mm. actually be seen earlier in the film when a nurse wheels it into his room That's after cool. he dies. Dude, I liked what they did with the guy. I know he's like just dying, but he looked super creepy as the goblin in uh, Amazing. Additionally, in an earlier version of this post credit scene, one of the chambers had a suspended ball of black goo that moved around, which would have been the symbiote. This was removed because Sony decided against including Venom in the Sinister Six in order to give him his own standalone film. Hmm. Drew Goddard, the filmmaker behind Cabin in the Woods, was hired to write and direct the Sinister Six, and his vision for the project was inspired by films like The Dirty Dozen and Reservoir Dogs, where you root for the protagonists even though they're the villains. That's crazy because that goes on to become like their whole fucking thing. A bunch of badass characters doing something, you know? It's like, let's admit that we love watching that. And while initial reports suggested that the film wouldn't feature Spider-Man, that turned out to not be the case, as Godard would go on to say, it was a Spider-Man movie. It was the giant, epic Spider-Man movie of my dreams. Huh. Godard also expressed his dislike for how Marvel movies are interconnected and often serve as stepping stones to set up future films and characters in the MCU. What dialect? Wakanda, wa, 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 Wakanda. By contrast, he wanted his movie to be able to stand on its own, saying, my vision was a summer and Annual, so you didn't have to worry about continuity. It was just, we take Peter, put him on an adventure, then we put him back in his life. Godard's film, which actually would have been a two-parter, was apparently bonkers, as he wanted to feature the Savage Land, complete with dinosaurs Ooh, that would and have been time dope. travel portals. However, Godard was most excited... And by the way, guys, uh, Godard is rumored to be one of the people they're looking at for Tom Holland's next Spider-Man. That would be kind of ironic, right? If he actually got in there. Interesting about Sandman, who he thought was going to steal the show. And his number one choice to play him was Tom Hardy, who'd eventually go on to play Venom. Godard wrote Flint Marco's character to be the anarchic enthusiast of the team who has fun while celebrating being bad. Godard felt Tom embodied that anarchy and triumphant nihilism, which we've seen him tap into before in roles like Bronson. But yeah. Godard wanted to crank the volume up here to 11. The end of the film would have seen Sandman storm through London as tall as a skyscraper like Godzilla. Following The Sinister Six would have been the sequel to The Amazing Spider-Man 2, which would have opened with Peter still mourning the death of Gwen Stacy as the film would focus on his struggle to recover and move on. And just like Spider-Man 3, Webb was eager to include Venom in his third Spider-Man film as well, where huh. the symbiote likely would have attached to Spider-Man and amplified his anger and guilt over Gwen's death. Fair. I mean, that would have been kind of cool, I'm not gonna lie. I stopped pulling my punches. Yep. I got rageful. 
The film would end with Peter separating from the symbiote, Pretty where cool. it would bond with Eddie Brock, setting up Venom for his own standalone adventure to follow, where he'd battle Carnage. Although there were also discussions about making Flash Thompson Venom instead, Ooh. inspired by the Agent Venom story. Dude, Agent Venom's so good, oh my god. Line. And in a bizarre plot point, Peter would have got his hands on a serum that could bring people back from the dead. Part of the discussion was that possibly in three, there was this idea at one point that uh, Spider-Man would be able to take this formula and regenerate the people in his life that had died. So there was this discussion about that Captain Stacy would come back even bigger in oh, wow. episode three. And I was like, let's go. Not only would Peter use this formula to bring Captain Stacy back to life, but he would have brought Gwen back too. The symbiote was also explored as a plot device to enable this. And in an extension that, of this idea, Sony also discussed turning Gwen into Carnage, which would what? have created a scenario where Peter was forced to kill her, but perhaps is able to say goodbye this time giving him the closure he needs Gwen and allowing him to finally move on. Cut from The that Amazing Spider-Man 2 were two key scenes with characters that would be saved for the sequel. The first would have introduced Mary Jane, played by Shailene Woodley. On cutting MJ scenes from the film, Webb would say, it was very difficult to introduce someone as a competing love interest when so much is on the table with Peter and Gwen. That's fair. Mary Jane was in four scenes, four scenes in the whole film, and it didn't make sense. They're introducing so many new characters, it really didn't make sense to introduce such a vital character to the comic books. It's interesting to wonder what MJ's role would have been in Amazing Spider-Man 3, considering yeah. Webb was planning to resurrect Gwen. It's rumored that in the film, Peter would have been encouraged to attend group counseling by Aunt May. It's at these sessions where he would meet MJ before the two would bond over their shared trauma. But as the relationship develops, Peter would have struggled to get closer and open himself up to her after what happened with Gwen. It's reasonable to assume that once Peter brings Gwen back from the dead, that would have put a halt to the progress of his budding relationship with Mary Jane. However, as the film concludes, Includes, and Peter finds closure by bidding farewell to Gwen, he would then take a step forward by asking MJ out, signifying his readiness to move on. The other notable scene cut from The Amazing Spider-Man 2 featured the return of Peter's dad, Richard Parker, who would reveal to Peter, I had to disappear to keep you safe. Peter, listen, listen to me. I had to disappear to keep my mistakes from catching up with you. I had to stay away from you to keep Osborne from hurting you. You understand what I'm saying? There was no other way to keep you safe. Assuming Webb would have brought mm, Richard back in the that. third That's film, it would have dealt with the repercussions of him reappearing, while exploring his nefarious connections to Oscorp and feud with Osborne, who Webb mm. originally wanted to bring back to life and feature as the main villain, before plans change with Godard reviving him for the Sinister Six instead. Felicity Jones, who appeared briefly in Spider-Man 2 as Felicia Hardy, and more prominently in deleted scenes, would have seen her role expanded as well to set up her own Black Cat standalone film. Other films rounding out the Spider-Man Spider-Man's cinematic universe included a Venom and Carnage film, and according to rumors at the time, an Aunt May spin-off film that would have been a cross between Agent Carter and Mad Men, featuring May's youthful adventures as a spy. I know what you're thinking, even Sally Field thought that idea was ridiculous. Garfield was also <laughs> eager to pass the torch to Miles Morales in the future, so it's likely we would have eventually seen that character take over the franchise. I just thought she was gonna be black. Oh man, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't apologize. There's gotta be a black Spider-Man somewhere out there. However, following the poor critical reception and underwhelming box office performance of Amazing Spider-Man 2, Sony began second-guessing their plans, as Wong Cap Day at Sony argued that they needed to lay out a solid five-year plan for the future, yeah. for not only their own internal clarity, but also yeah. to demonstrate to fans that Spidey is in safe hands. He called the Aunt May spinoff bizarre and suggested they create a dedicated spider division that runs as a studio within the studio, Smart. so that they can Smart. properly plan out their cinematic universe. Look, it's that fucking guy again, man. Throughout all this shit. There's a studio within the studio so that they you can see this guy. And then they have the gall to put a special thank you to this guy for like Spider-Man No Way Home. Holy shit properly plan out their cinematic universe. He boldly proposed the following five films to follow The Amazing Spider-Man 2 and act as their cinematic universe's version of Marvel's Phase 1. In a never-before-seen move, the first film would have been a prequel to The Amazing Spider-Man 2 that would feature Kraven the Hunter as the villain. Everyone at Sony was a massive fan of Emma and Andrew's chemistry and felt that they had killed her character off way too soon. Not only that, but execs at Sony were frustrated that Amazing Spider-Man 2 took place 
after graduation, when one of the major reasons for the reboot was to be able to put Peter back in high school so that they could tell stories in that environment to differentiate it from the Raimi films. So by doing a prequel, not only would they be able to rectify this, but also rectify killing Gwen off too soon, as well as Norman Osborn, who they'd be able to bring back instead of stupidly reanimating his head as they had planned. In this version, Norman is getting increasingly sicker, so he hires a Russian big game hunter named Craven to track Spider-Man down and bring him in, yeah. as Norman believes that in Peter's blood is the key to cure his disease. Craven ultimately captures Spider-Man and supplies Norman with vials of his blood. Norman, in an attempt to synthesize a cure for his illness, ends up transforming into the Green Goblin. The end of the film would see Spidey and Goblin battle it out, with Goblin losing and barely escaping with his life, which leads us to the frail state in which we encounter Norman in Amazing Spider-Man 2. Huh. Juan suggested following this film with Godard's Sinister Six movie before doing a Spider-Man 2099 Ooh. spin-off that would act as their Captain America type franchise. Yeah. But instead of a World War II period film, it would be set in the future in the year 2099 and That's be a dope. Miguel O'Hara origin story. The end of the film would see Miguel being sent back in time to present day New York City. This film would be followed by a Venom film, which would see Eddie Brock's origin story and eventual defeat by Spider-Man, ending with Eddie being sent to Rikers. An after credit scene would then set up Carnage. But before we get to that film, we get a Black Cat film that would see Felicia Hart. My head's spinning just over the last 30 seconds. Like, can you imagine being Kevin Feige and going into a room with all of these Sony people and just hearing like that shit? Like, it just sounds like noise. It's just like, mm, and then we do this, and then we do this, and then we do this. And granted, some of it sounds cool because I like the comics, but it's party get her luck powers from Kingpin. This film would end with an encounter with Spider-Man, leading to a realization that she is not the bad person she appears to be. Finally, all of these films would culminate in an Avengers-type film that would see Spidey, Black Cat, Venom, and Spidey 2099 team up to take down Carnage. Obviously, none of that this ended cool. up coming to fruition, as Sony realized that they had no idea what they were doing and turned to Marvel for help. You could not live with your own failure. <laughs> Where did that bring you? Back to me. <laughs> and as they negotiated a deal to bring Spider-Man into the MCU, That's it soon good. became apparent that Andrew Garfield wouldn't be going with. And the reason for it may be pettier than you realize, although it likely was a result of a number of different factors. The first was Garfield's failure to show up to a planned press event in Rio, offending top Sony brass. Your timing is terrible, it started already. Then Sony CEO Kaz Hirai had planned on mentioning Garfield in his speech and then dine alongside him for dinner. Garfield arrived in Rio with a scruffy beard and claimed to be feeling under the weather and exhausted after coming off the plane. An hour before the event, Garfield pulled out, throwing the plans into disarray. Understandably, many Sony studio execs were embarrassed by Garfield's last minute absence. While Sony CEO Kaz Hirai felt personally slighted, Garfield would go on to rub the studio the wrong way again. Wait a minute. So are you saying all of these studio people are just like me? Like I'm starting to like put together here. Like we were talking about all this like pettiness and all this like craziness. Like they're just like me for real. This is like, uh, we're, we, you and I are not so different. Holy shit. Again, by publicly blaming them for meddling with and ruining what he felt was a solid script for Amazing Spider-Man 2, saying, I read the script that Alex Kurtzman and Bob Orsi wrote, and I generally loved it. I think what happened was when you have something that works as a whole, and then you start removing portions of it and saying, no, that doesn't work, then the thread is broken, and it's hard to go with the flow of the story. Certain people at the studio had problems with certain parts there of it, is again. and ultimately the studio is the final say in those movies because they're the tent poles, so you have to answer to those people. There he is I signed up to serve the story and to serve yeah, this incredible yeah. character that I've been dressing as since I was three. Yeah. And then there's, the, it gets compromised and and it, it, and it, and it, and it breaks breaks your, breaks my heart. Bro yeah, I got I, I got heartbroken that. a little bit. It's also debatable how big a fan Kevin Feige was of Garfield's performance, as he criticized it for being too emotional after viewing a rough cut of the second film, saying Andrew's performance is all over the place, a lot of crying and then a lot of mania. Hard to track him emotionally sometimes. It also that's undermines fair. his reaction to Gwen's death because I think that's actually fair. You know what I mean? I wonder if any of that then comes across in notes in No Way Home. He gets upset and emotional a lot. It's also evident that Kevin wasn't a big fan of Webb's characterization of Peter Parker either, or the storyline revolving around his father, commenting, not sure what Peter learns at Roosevelt is entirely correct. We're distracted by- By the way, a lot of this shit that you're hearing right now in the video comes from the Sony email leaks because Feige will tell, he'll say like publicly, 
I'm not involved like in the earlier Sony stuff. And yet he was giving notes on every single movie. He would see stuff. He was giving notes. It's in the emails. Like you can see it. By the idea that Peter became Spider-Man because of his father's blood. All the special backstory with his super scientist dad fights with the idea that Peter is a normal kid from Queens who becomes the greatest superhero in the world. True. Based on these yeah. comments, I'd imagine when the time came to explore bringing Spider-Man into the MCU, Kevin likely championed rebooting and recasting the characters so they could ditch the Richard Parker storyline to make Peter just a regular kid and find a younger actor to portray him to put him back in high school, which is exactly what they ended up doing. When Stan and Steve Ditko created him in the early 60s, it was not as a standalone hero by himself in Manhattan. It was as this kid with these amazing powers trying to compete and do his best in a world where Iron Man's in an ivory tower and Thor's from another planet and Steve Rogers was frozen in ice for 70 years. And with the success true, of the yeah. MCU's version of Spider-Man, Sony once again felt emboldened to try their hand at creating their own Spider-Man cinematic universe. And the results so far have been mixed. While Venom was a monster hit at the box office, its sequel did only half the business. True. Morbius fared even worse true. as the comically bad film became an internet meme. And in a sign of how out of touch Sony execs are, they announced announced the film would return to a thousand theaters weeks after its initial theatrical <laughs> run, thinking the film's explosion of attention online was because fans genuinely loved it, not understanding that everyone was just making fun of it. Yep. Upon its re-release, the film bombed, and Sony quickly pulled it from theaters again. Also, let's not forget about this forced post credit scene featuring Morbius and Vulture deciding <laughs> to team up, which featured a stand-in as Michael Keaton didn't even bother to show up to film it, and I can't say I blame him. <laughs> Next on Sony's slate is Craven the Hunter, featuring what looks like oh, Rhino as over the Madame main Webb. villain. And with Andrew Garfield's return to the role of Spider-Man, combined with Sony's insistence on creating their own cinematic universe, one can't help but wonder if Sony is planning to bring Garfield back to take on all of these villains. Maybe there's hope for Drew Goddard's Sinister Six script after all. Remember, he wrote it to be a standalone adventure and continues to say that it could easily slot in anywhere. Yep. Amy Pascal also recently said she's ready to make his film whenever he is. Which is kind of interesting because this could be why he's being looked at for Spider-Man 4 with Tom Holland because a lot of the rumors suggest they want to bring in a lot of the Sinister Six. And you might have the Sinister Six acting as like mercenaries or muscle for Mayor Wilson Fisk fighting against vigilantes like Spider-Man. So I wonder if that's just like a good kind of fit for them considering uh, what he was working on. You know what I mean? Is. Thanks for watching everybody. And that was a good one. That was a good one, man. I like that. I enjoyed that one.